Hi, Sophie. Hi, Sam. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Snack Covenant episode 326. And today we're discussing the sketches found in Armored Core. Armored Core 6 has this interesting little system that we're going to talk about in this very short, brief episode, because it's really our first episode on Armored Core 6, in which you find these images by a war artist who is initially referred to as STV. Mm -hmm. And you'll later on find out that actually the STV, the V, is probably virtual. And that's AI art derived from an initial artist who was called STK, and STK died during the fires of Rubicon. Right. That's not super important to what we're discussing now. What we're discussing is all the people that you see in those images. Basically, I was going through them, and I had this sudden realization that there are exactly enough people in those images to correspond one-to-one with all the people you fight in the arena plus all the NPCs you hear about. So this is the game's way of giving everybody a face. Mm -hmm. There's seven of these images, and we're just going to go through them in numerical order. Maybe not the order you find them in, but numerical order. So, Sophie, let's start with the first sketch, STV Sketch 1. Yeah, so STV Sketch 1 is a group of people sitting around a table, and the description is just old man, brackets, seated, looks like he's seen some things. So this image represents the Rubicon Liberation Front. This seated old man is Father Dolmayan. Mm -hmm. So Father Dolmayan we know is an old man because he was a doser, which is someone who basically is a coral addict. Yeah. And he was a doser before the fires of Ibis, which was 50 years ago. So he is however old he was then, plus 50. So he's probably in his 70s, maybe early 80s. So that makes sense. He's an old man. He's seen some things because he's achieved this weird coral symbiosis thing. Right. He's leader of the front. He's the old man. He's seen some things. And even the way he's sitting, he seems to be relaxed, leading, and people seem to be kind of gathered around him in this picture. Yeah. Yeah. So from that, we can kind of figure out everybody else in the image. So we know that Dolmayan has a lover called Freddy. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that there is a younger man standing next to Dolmayan with his arm around Dolmayan's shoulder, so we can assume that that is Freddy. Yes. Then we have two figures in the front. There's a very young, very sort of slight-looking lady, and she's giving what looks like a dumpling or something to this seated figure who kind of looks like Bateau from Ghost in the Shell. (laughs) Yes. So those are Ziyi and Rokumusen. So Ziyi, we know is she's like the only um, woman in that group. She's described as the little sister. She's always described as being like quite small and young, and that fits with what we're seeing. And with regard to Roku Monsen, we know that Roku Monsen is obsessed with Japanese culture, and he was taken in by the Rubicon Liberation Front. Specifically, he was taken in by Zi, and she gave him food. So we see literally in this image, there is the small lady, and she is handing food to this guy, who looks like he is addressed, and it's it's kind of hard to tell because they introduce all these little glitch effects in the images, but he looks a lot like he's wearing like a sort of Japanese-style robe. So I would say, okay, that's Z and Roku Monsen. So that leaves us with the three on the other side. So presumably that leaves us with the two other fingers of the group, which are indexed arm and middle flat well. Mm-hmm. I would say that the kind of beefier, brawnier guy in the front is probably Index Durham. Yeah. Because he's always referred to as being, like, a very physical, very capable character who, like, has a background as a construction worker. His doser is like a pickaxe, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, whereas Flatwell is described as being the military strategist of the group. So you actually see the guy in the back, he's... Uh, He seems a lot older looking and he's sort of gesturing with his hand, like he's sort of telling you, like, listen to what Durham is saying, like they're planning a strategy. Um, Other interesting thing, I don't know if this is a little uh, intentional joke or not, that the guy who's indexed Durham, it looks like he's pointing with his index finger, whereas Flightwell's gesturing with his whole hand. So that might just be a little (laughs) like index Durham index finger thing. That is pretty cute. (laughs) Yeah. So then there's the character who is standing behind the two of them. Um, That is... A little more questionable. It could be the character called Messam that you hear about but never meet in the mission where you have to rescue the prisoners. Mm-hmm. 
So there's a guy there called Messam. Uh, he dies during interrogation, so you never meet him, but that might be Messam. It might also be Rusty, because we know that Rusty is a double agent who's working for the Rubicon Liberation Front, but is currently embedded in the Vespers. So I'd say it's either Messam or Rusty. And the thing is that uh, we don't actually get a very clear look at a lot of these characters' faces because of both the drawing style and the way that it will deliberately introduce these sort of glitching effects. Like you can't actually really make out Dolmayan's face in this because it's just this blur. So it's sort of hard to pin down like who is who on the basis of faces because a lot of them don't really have them. But yeah, so that kind of gives us uh, who is who in sketch one. So we've got Dolmayan, Freddy, Roku Monsen, Z, uh, Durham, Flatwell, and either Messam or Rusty. And Flatwell needs to mind his own business because him coming between me and Rusty is really inappropriate. I oh, know there's, there's so much relationship drama in this game. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so the next picture is yep. STV Sketch 2. Yeah, STV Sketch 2 depicts a woman who is seated on an RAD mech. You can specifically tell it's an RAD mech from the design. And in front of her, there is a guy who is standing up and they seem to be conversing. And then there is a much larger figure who is lying on the ground, looks like he's passed out. And the description just says, the woman's the one in charge. She's the smartest of the bunch. Have I seen her somewhere before though? The woman in charge is Carla because Carla is in charge of RAD. And right. STV has seen her before because she was present at the fires of Ibis. This is something in the game that, like, it pretty much deserves its own episode because it's kind of complicated. But the idea that Carla was present for this event 50 years ago, but she does not appear to have aged since then. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say right now, like, as far as I can tell, there is nothing in the game that actually lists, like, reasons why someone might not age in this world. I mean, there are theories as to how it can happen. Maybe it's the effect of the coral. Maybe yeah, it's the effect yeah. of the augmentation. Maybe she's a scientist. Maybe she figured out a way. But there's no specific way that the game outright states it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, like, every one of those things, like, like, for example, you can say it's the coral, but, like, Dolmayan's been doing coral longer than Carla has, and he's definitely aged. No one else mentions other people not aging and things like that. Like, it's just not, it's flagged up repeatedly in mm -hmm. dialogue that Carla should be older yeah. than she looks, but yep. it's never elaborated on. So there's all sorts of, she may literally just have been frozen. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, so that's Carla sitting on top of the mech. The guy who is passed out is probably Invincible Rummy because it talks about Rummy's member of RAD. He is uh, constantly like just out of his mind on Coral. Like he just takes Coral and passes out all the time. So the passed out big guy is probably Invincible Rummy. And that would mean that the guy who's standing up is Honest Brute uh, because he's the other named member of the RAD. The traitor. He is a traitor and he's described as someone who was like kind of like slick and like, you know, like a good people person. So that makes sense. He's the one talking. So he's got Carla's attention. Yeah. He's probably like, you know, manipulating her, lying to her to get some tech before he leaves with it. And Rami's just passed out on the floor. So that is sketch number two. And one more thing. I think that Chatty isn't the computer. Yeah. So Ch Ch Chatty <laughs> is interesting because I said that there's an image for everybody. Yeah. And um, technically there's not an image for Chatty because Chatty is an AI. Yeah. Chatty could just be in the head of that robot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That may actually be Chatty's robot for all we know. Good job. Sketch number three. Yep. So SDV sketch three shows us six figures who are sitting around in what looks like a kind of hangar. You can see a mech or possibly a spaceship or something in the background. They're all wearing vaguely military gear, but not really a military uniform per se. And SDV's notes just say awful bunch, never again. So who could this be? But the red guns. <laughs> yeah. And they're known as an awful bunch because even Walter warns us about them. Yeah. He's like, don't let them teach you bad manners. Yeah. So this is um this is going to happen if, uh, in a couple more of the images where like we know the faction being represented but it's hard to definitively say who is who in the image. So um the two people in the background they're probably Michigan and Nile because they're the two that are in control. They're the commanders. You can see okay there is like just the stance they have, the fact that like he has quite a long coat and everything like that. Like he looks like he is in charge. Yes. And then there's a guy kind of like conversing with him. So I'm assuming it's probably Michigan on the left and Nile on the right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The others are a little harder to ID, but I think you can kind of do it. Because we know that Iguazu and Volta have a history of quarreling with each other. And you can <laughs> yeah. see in the front, 
you got two people who are sitting opposite each other and they're, they're adopting this body language like they're talking. Mm -hmm. So I would say that those are probably Iguazu and Volta, although it's not clear which is which. I don't know how you would identify Iguazu or Volta, but that looks like Iguazu and Volta. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. I think the figure on the extreme right who's kind of coming through a door, that might just be Red, because Red is described as being a new recruit. And he looks like he's just sort of coming and saying, hey, guys, he's not as sort of integrated into the unit as everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that would mean just by process of elimination that the guy on the far left is Wu Huahai um, or possibly Hakra. Yeah, maybe he never even made it to this point. Yeah, yeah. We don't know exactly when this was done is the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's sketch number three. Now, Sophie, SDV sketch four. Yeah, so SDV Sketch 4 is quite easy to figure out because it is literally eight people in a line and one of them is wearing an Archibus branded uh, little coat <laughs> thing. So pretty easy to figure out. Eight people who work for Archibus, mm -hmm. that would be the eight vestments. Yes. And similar to the last one, it's kind of hard to tell who is who because we really don't get any information on what anyone looks like. Mm -hmm. um, the one we can kind of definitively ID is Metalink. Because she's the, she's the only woman <laughs> in the squad. Yeah. And okay, so the, the woman there is probably Maitalink. The others, it's just like big question mark, not really clear who is who. Um, STV says that there was a request for interview was met with snide derision from the most important looking member of the group. That would be Snail. Uh, because even though Snail is not in command, he is the, uh, he's the one that does the whole derision thing. He's the most condescending of them. And it also says they're not all bad. One of them offered me a cup of coffee. I'm guessing that was Rusty because Rusty is the only nice one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's because he's not actually a Vesper. He's a double agent. And it's possible that Rusty is the one on the left who's holding, looks like an iPhone. Rusty is a double agent. He's been sending information back and forth between the RLF and himself. He's getting messages from his side thinker. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. So that that might, if you had to give them a name, like that's definitely Maitalink, and that's probably Rusty. Mm -hmm. As for the rest of them, just big question marks. You don't really get a sense of like you know who, they talk about them being various levels of augmented, but you can't actually tell from looking at that who has what augmentations. It's just eight people with their backs to you. I feel like the jacket is significant, like the one putting on the jacket, but I couldn't. Yeah, I mean that could be anything. snail. I don't know. Also, I initially thought there's only seven of them, but it's because of the, like the glitching effect. The guy with the jacket's partially obscuring someone else, so there, there are all eight of them. It is a full complement of the eight Vespers. STV sketch number five. Okay, so STV sketch number five has two kind of sinister-looking figures. They seem to be exchanging uh, wads of cash, and that appears to be related to the dead body at their feet, who we don't actually see. We just see uh, the feet of this, pe of this uh, corpse sticking out from behind a sofa. And on the other side of the sofa, cowering in fear, is <laughs> another character. And the notes from STV say, caught a couple of hired killers on the prowl, managed to sneak in a sketch without being noticed. And then there's a quote from one of them that says, the fool won't pay back what he owes. Mm -hmm. So this is one where it's a little trickier to identify them. The one of the two hitmen is probably Cold Call, because Cold Call is described as being a killer for hire. And the other one, Sin, I believe you wanted to say something here. We talked about this picture a lot. We've actually been talking about Armored Core a lot every morning for however long <laughs> it's been out. And um, I think that the other guy is Collector, who is mentioned in one of the notes. Yeah, so Collector is a character who you don't actually directly interact with, but you find a log left over from him. That's like a recording of his last minutes where he's been ambushed by RAD. He's saying, like, I'm looking for someone who owes me a lot of money. They've escaped into the grid. I can't find them. The person who owes them a lot of money would be Nosak. Yeah. Or Nosak. Yeah. And what's interesting about Nosak is that you find the collector's remains inside a pipe that's full of molten metal. But if you go up the other pipe that's not full of molten metal, Nosak's actually hiding in there. Yeah, and when you come to see him, he thinks you're the assassin. He's like, oh, you think I'm going to pay you back? And I'm like, well, if you owe money, you should know Zach. Absolutely, yeah. Nosek's whole thing is basically like, if you die owing money, you've beaten the system. <laughs> yeah. 
And you had another theory. You mentioned that one of the killers could be Sulla. Yeah. So the other possible ID for one of the killers would be Sulla. Um, basically, just because when you encounter Sulla, Sulla's listing like a, here's all the people I've killed. Um, but at the same time, Sulla seems to specifically want to go for Walter's augmented hounds. Yeah. 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 So. And the thing is, like I said, we've been talking about this a lot. And one of the theories we talked about, which I don't think is correct, but I personally really like, is that the person cowering behind the couch is Rusty, the dead person is six to one, and the two people are assassins, and that's why Rusty is so attached to us, because he couldn't save us before, and now he's trying to protect us throughout the game. Yeah, that, that, was, that was what I initially thought it might be. Um, until I had that epiphany that, like, oh, wait, they're giving faces specifically to the NPCs. Now, Sophie, STV Sketch 6. STV Sketch 6 is three figures in front of a mech. There's a very small, very slight lady who's wearing, uh, you described it as office an office uniform. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, she's she's dressed to be working in an office, basically. Next to her is someone, another lady, who's dressed for combat. Sort of obscured, again, by the weird glitch art filter, there is what seems to be, like, a much uh, older and sort of heavy set man. And the description of this is, these independent mercenaries are members of a group of four, brackets, one serves as operator, weren't willing to answer many questions, and then it says, never got to meet up with the fourth member. Aww... Well, no, it's okay, because we do get to meet the fourth member. Yeah, we suck. Honestly, when Raven confronted me, I felt so cringy. I was like, I'm sorry, you're right, I shouldn't have done this. Yeah. And then I killed her. (laughs) So, yeah, this is Branch. Yes. Uh, Branch is, like, an aspect of the story that's really, really significant, but it's not really highlighted to the extent that like RAD or Overseer are. But basically Overseer, which is the the group that's sort of trying to control what's happening on Rubicon, they have this little independent um, mercenary group called Branch working for them. Branch are like described as like a rotating group of people. So it's like, this is just the current incarnation of Branch. All right. So this is Branch. And just going from right to left, we have King King is described as being the oldest member of Branch, and he is a pilot, so guy on the right, King. Going left from there, we have the woman in the middle, that would be Chartreuse. She is also a pilot. She's described as being the second oldest. Then we have the much smaller, much more conservatively dressed lady. That would be Raven's operator, because it specifically says here one serves as the operator, so that's Raven's operator. And the fourth member of Branch which is introduced as a plot twist in one of the later missions where you defend Galia Dam. The fourth member of Branch was Raven. Mm -hmm. So the person whose ID we stole is the one who's not in this image. Mm -hmm. So we've got from right to left, we've got King Chartreuse, the operator, and then Raven conspicuous by their absence. Excellent. Now, SDK sketch. Finally, we come to what we're calling number seven, even though it's not numbered. And the reason it's not numbered is because it is STK, not STV. STK was the original artist, and all the derivatives we've seen since then are STV. So STK died in the fires of Ibis. So this presumably was done very shortly before they died because of who it depicts. And the notes just say, Professor, two assistants, boy. Assistant one heading for breakdown. Boy is sharper than he looks. So this is probably the most straightforward to figure out because mm-hmm. we are given access to Nagai's logs where he does like n- specify his assistance and like, you know, the boy and everything. So this is pretty simple. Figure in the center is Nagai. We know that because uh, like all science fiction professors, he is wearing a lab coat. Yeah. <laughs> but also he is manipulating what seems to be this weird sort of energy ball, which I think is supposed to be like coral tech that he's working on. So then we have the two assistants, which are just called assistant one and assistant two. We know from the guy's logs and from like a bunch of other stuff that's, that's talked about that assistant number one is Walter's father. Yes. And he had a nervous breakdown due to all the stress that was going on um, when they were working on the coral that led up to fires of Ibis. Mm -hmm. Assistant number two is Carla. Yeah. That's essentially explicitly stated multiple times. Carla was the guy's assistant. And 
he specifically says, and the guy says, like, you know, I'm going to have to pass all my sins, everything I did, onto my assistant. It's up to her to fix my mistakes. That's why Carla comes back. And, um, yeah, that's also why in the earlier sketch you get the note saying, have I seen her somewhere before? Because he has seen her somewhere before. He saw her 50 years ago, and she hasn't changed. So, again, as far as I can tell, that's not explained um, how that works, but it may be expanded on at some point because it feels like the setup for a story that's not finished yet. So I'm wondering if we're actually going to get, like, I can't imagine there won't be DLC, but I'm wondering, like, will we get DLC that expands on the Carla thing? I hope we get Armor Core 7. But that's just, that's interesting because, like, that the sort of the old model for Armored Core was, like, you'd have Armored Core 4, and then you'd have, like, Armored Core 4 answer, which is essentially, like, I feel like that would have been, it's like a half sequel. And I feel like if this were done today, Armored Core 4 answer would have been like an old Hunter style expansion to Armored Core 4. Sort of. Armored Core 6 conclusion. It has to be a pun on 6. We're not on video, but Sin is making a very confused face right now. I'm trying to think of a pun on 6. I don't don't know. (laughs) Are you going to Google it? Go to chat GPT. 6 puns. Um, uh, If it ain't broke, don't 6 it. That's not a pun. That's uh, <laughs> I'm <laughs> core, if it ain't broke, broke don't six it. A lot of these seem to be AI generated. <laughs> yeah, let's go to Chatty. <laughs> Are you generating things again? <laughs> it was remarkably pressing into them to have an AI called Chatty, Chatty in the subplot GPT. about AI art, wasn't it? Come up with your own uh, Armored Core Six pun and put it in the comments below. So the final. Uh, Character in that who's just described as boy who's sharper than he looks is Walter. Because Walter yes. was a kid when Fire Survivors happened. And he was rescued, sent away, it says he lived on Jupiter or the Jupiter colonies. And uh, he's come back now as an older person, which is, again, why the whole Carla thing is so weird. Because, like, Walter has gone away presumably as, like, you know, a nine or a ten-year-old. And he's come back mm-hmm. as, like, a late 50s, early 60s yeah, guy. Yeah. Because it's been, but then um, Carla has not changed at all. So yeah, um, that actually gives us a complete list of who is who and who is in what image. Now, Sophie, like I said, we've been discussing Armored Core a lot. Yeah. And in the old days, every one of those conversations would have been a podcast. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So we have a lot of things to say about Armored Core. We do, we do. Is there one thing that you'd like to get off your chest before we finish today's episode? So, um, like I've mentioned, I have been a fan of Armored Core since the late 90s. And uh, consequently, like, I have a lot of friends who are also fans of Armored Core, people who I know, like, who, who I became friends with and talked about Armored Core, like, before I even really played the Souls games. So something that I've noticed is, like, a lot of my friends who were very, very into the previous games... They're finding their experience with Six to be a little rocky. Um, not necessarily that they're, they don't like it, but that they're bouncing off certain aspects of it because, yes, it's like clearly got a lot of Armored Core DNA in it. It's visibly an Armored Core game. No one would deny that. But it also has a lot of Sekiro's DNA in it. And a lot of it plays like a character action game more so than the previous ones that had a much bigger emphasis on like the sort of simulation rivet counting aspect of like, I'm going to spend all day min maxing my robot stats. Um, Yeah. Armored Core 6, it wants you to play it in a specific way that isn't really jiving with certain people. So I just want to say that like Sin and I will be effusively praising this game. Because, Sin, I think this is probably your favorite FromSoft game since Bloodborne. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you may actually like it more than Bloodborne based on I, I think recent... I'm starting to. I think I'm starting yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, we, we both adore this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just want to say, like, um, that's how we feel. And if you are a longtime fan and you're not liking this direction for the series, um, please don't take us praising it as like as a criticism of you not liking it because the fact is like i i am someone who likes simulation stuff and also likes character action and i can completely understand that if the simulation stuff was the big appeal for you and you weren't a massive fan of like 
you didn't also want to play Metal Gear Rising. I can understand why you might bounce off this and that's like, so I just want to say like, don't take it the wrong way when we're talking about like, this is great. Like if you, if you don't like this direction, like I understand, it's just, I understand why you don't like it, but yeah, it's a definitely. direction I also like. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Sin, is there anything you need to get off your chest? Iguazu needs therapy. Well, it's a good thing that the game contains an electroshock gun called Therapist and Freud. <laughs> <laughs>